shall leave with greater wisdom and shared experiences so that we may impact the lives and communities from where we hail. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Dr. Zanetta Rollins. I know it was very last minute, and you don't like that, but that's why you are a member of parliament for such a vibrant constituency. Our clerk to parliament is a learned man. He's been in parliament um, from the inception of the Fourth Republican Parliament. He has enormous experience in how parliament functions, and has benefited from various meetings, conferences, that discuss parliaments not just in Africa, but the world over. He's very, very pa passionate about talking about how things are done in other parliaments and always urges us to emulate the best parliaments in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome the clerk to our parliament, Mr. Cyril Kwabna Oting Insia, to give us a welcome address. Honorable Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Minister for National Security, Honorable Members of the Leadership of Parliament, Honorable Members of Parliament, the Leader and Members of the CPA UK team, Representatives from the Commonwealth, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Deputy Clerks, Principal Assistant Clerks, Directors, and Officers of the Parliamentary Service, Distinguished Invited Guests, our friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome you cordially to this auspicious event which marks the opening of a three-day workshop on trade and security organized by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, United Kingdom, in partnership with the Parliament of Ghana. It is indeed an honor to warmly welcome our friends from the Commonwealth who have found Ghana a favorable destination for congregation of experts to under the theme, Effective Parliament in Times of Complexities, discuss matters germane to the sustainability of the globe and economies of the world. The objective of the workshop is to help develop a greater understanding of the operations of parliamentary trade, security, and gender committees in the Commonwealth. This, I believe, will promote discussions on experiences, issues, and good practices relating to effective functioning of parliamentary committees, as well as taking a practical approach to building the capacity of parliamentarians to address challenges associated with trade, security, and gender roles. The Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, in a bid to strengthen parliaments and democracies across the Commonwealth, continues to make credible information available to equip its members in making evidence-informed decisions that will culminate in formulation of policies to address the challenges confronting our nations, especially in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the adverse effects of the virus on, every, on the very existence of the human race is evident, particularly in view of the alarming rate at which we have lost a significant number of people to the disease in recent years. The resultant human resource deficit, as well as the depletion of state resources in combating the constantly mutating virus and our inability to find a lasting remedy for the disease has taken a great toll on the economies of the world. Now, in a bid to build resilience, against the current challenges posed by the virus, parliaments in general, and particularly 
of the Commonwealth must pay attention to developing and implementing mechanisms that will boost trade, enhance security, and improve gender relations. This workshop is therefore taking a place at a time when we need to become a unified force in the face of current global difficulties. Despite the various challenges in our dispensation, the use of digitalization and virtual tools is on the ascendancy, and we must all embrace the opportunities they present in helping us navigate the complexities currently associated with trade, security, and gender responsiveness. Deliberations on the topics outlined for discussion during the sessions of the workshop will result in a cross-fertilization of ideas for the growth of our respective parliaments and renew our commitment to improve the lot of our nations and the world at large. I once again welcome you warmly to this event. I entreat our distinguished guests to enjoy their stay in Accra and relish Ghanaian hospitality. Let us all continue to observe the COVID-19 safety protocols and protect ourselves from the infection and spread of the virus. I thank you for your attention. His middle name, Kwabna, means that he was born on Tuesday and his birthday is fast approaching, so we just might have a party here in Parliament. Um, the next speaker is a former member of Parliament for Ifeja Sechure West in the Ashanti region of Ghana. He was also the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee. At the moment, he's the Minister of National Security and one that we keep calling on. It feels like he's not left Parliament because we see him here so often. Ladies and gentlemen, honourable members, please help me to welcome the Minister for National Security, the Honourable Kandapa. So, right, Honourable Speaker, and distinguished Honourable Participants, they keep referring to me as the Minister for National Security. Uh, that is not quite right. I'm the Minister for National Stability. <laughs> Stability. Stability. Yes. <laughs> and I want to set my remarks uh, this morning against this background. Certainly an honor for me to be present here today, share my thoughts with you on the theme of this workshop. I think the timing is good. And I think the, the theme selected to drive the discussions could not have been perfect, given the astonishing challenges confronting parliaments across the world, particularly those in fledgling democracies in Africa, uh, not excluding Ghana. Let me therefore commend the CPA for partnering the Parliament of Ghana to organize this program. The CPA's consistent advocacy for good governance through the promotion of sound parliamentary practices and standards remains integral in driving development and also ensuring the sustenance of the democratic stability of members of the Commonwealth. I have benefited from such initiatives during my days as a parliamentarian in Ghana. For 16 years, I saw myself debating and I saw myself clashing with the right honorable speaker on a daily basis. Hopefully when I left, you were still the best uh, of friends. He didn't like some of the words I used, but he believed in parliamentary democracy. So, in setting the tone for my remarks, let me re-emphasize that I'm a former member of the Parliament of Ghana. The developments around Ghana's legislative system, both past and present, shall be the strategic context within which my thoughts on the theme for this workshop should would be situated. And it is worth noting 
that 2022 marks the 30th year of Ghana's fourth Republican constitution. Yet, as you may all be aware, the current parliament, the eighth legislature of the fourth republic, finds itself in what I tend to refer to as a parliamentary crisis, unprecedented in the history of the country. If Ghana were to be practicing the purest form of the Westminster system of governance, this current parliament, I think, would have been described as a near-hung parliament. Evidently, the near-hung nature of our age parliament of the Fourth Republic, where none of the two major political parties in the country can claim an overwhelming majority in the House, introduces a strange phenomenon to Ghana's democracy. Totally unknown to us, we never suspected that we would get to this point. Unsurprisingly, the early days of the journey along this unfamiliar path has been rough. It's been turbulent. It's occasioned some unpleasant qualities of rancor and at times fistfights and ultimately threatening to undo the democratic gains made thus far. But come to think about it, when you consider holding government to account as one of the most important rules of parliament, a hung parliament can be very useful. And I think there are so many good things that we should be able to get out of this. A study of the evolution of Ghana's parliament under the Fourth Republic actually reveals an interesting insight. The composition of the current parliament, where majority is decided by a narrow margin of one seat, is in sharp contrast to the first parliament of the Fourth Republic, which operated as a one-sided legislature due to the decision of the then opposition party to boycott the 1992 parliamentary elections. What does this observation imply for the growth of Ghana's parliamentary practice? Varying degrees of interpretation could be made out of this insight, depending on the interests and motivations of the one conducting the analysis. Whereas some consider the new development as a threat, given that it equips the minority with immense powers to obstruct government business, others view it positively as a departure from the perceived robust stamping nature of parliament, endowing it with the much needed impetus to serve as a powerful check on the executive. We love democracy. All of us love democracy. But the only reason we love democracy is because of the checks and balances. Democracy, without the checks and balances, doesn't qualify to be democracy. When it comes to the checks and balances, the only institution best positioned to do that is parliament. Parliament is the only institution that can hold government to account. So what then should be the way forward in order for Ghana to avoid the latter? And incidentally, the present crop of politicians, both sides, government, minority parties, most of us came out of parliament. So we know ourselves very, very well. The right honorable speaker has been on the other side. I have always such on another side. But we know ourselves. We are friends. We trust each other. And it helps. Every parliamentarian, especially those who have been in parliament for a long time, know every minister. Because we were colleagues. 
because they were friends in Parliament, a powerful tool that has been given to us, and we need to be able to make good use of it. And I think an objective diagnosis of the current legislative situation is the first step towards avoiding the pitfall of a destructive parliament. This enables the appreciation of the fact that the tools needed for the successful conduct of business in a parliament are completely different from that used in parliaments where there is a palpable numerical difference between the majority and minority. It's a hung parliament. The best system for emerging democracies in Africa? Some say yes. But we need to be able to work together to realize the benefits of the hung parliament. And I think an appreciation of this fact would enable the deadlocks that arise from a hung or a near hung parliament to be considered as necessary conflicts which should elicit the application of proactive conflict resolution mechanisms such as consensus building and joint problem solving approaches rather than the confrontational means which more often than not further fuel disagreements and unnecessarily entrench positions of the two sides of the house, much to the discomfort of the Minister for National Stability. And more importantly, I think the novelty of the prevailing situation in Ghana's eighth parliament has shed light on numerous dark spots and circumstances which have not been adequately accounted for in the standing orders of parliament and the constitution of the land, underscoring the need for a review of or the introduction of new laws. An example of such a situation probably is the election of the Speaker and Deputy Speakers of Parliament. My own view. Article 95 of the 1992 Constitution makes adequate provisions for the election of a Speaker of Parliament, either from among members of Parliament or from persons qualified to become members of Parliament. Additionally, Article 97 explicitly states that a Speaker elected from among members of parliament vacates his seat as a member of parliament, paving way for a by-election to be conducted. The constitution, however, allows the election of a deputy speaker of parliament from among members of parliament without barring them from retaining their seats as members of parliament. In this situation, together with a lack of clarity or a misinterpretation of the standing orders on quorum formation was the basis for a recent confusion between the majority and the minority in Ghana's uh, parliament, where a deputy speaker presiding over the house in the absence of the speaker had to include himself as part of members of parliament available for a quorum to be formed. A challenge, challenge because of the lack of clarity I believe our parliament has parliamentarians capable of finding their way around this. I'm going forward. We look forward to uh, such collaboration and cooperation. My father said something to me when I was young. He said, when you see two people fight, don't you ever think that one doesn't know why he's fighting. They are fighting because they believe that there is a cause to fight. But at the end of the day, you will find that one was guilty, you one was not guilty. Only negotiations, only by talking, do we find this thing out. Disagreement is not a problem, but we should be able to find a way to resolve it. Ghana is the first country to find itself in such a parliamentary partner. History is replete with events of such nature in other jurisdictions where the majority and minority worked collaboratively to advance the interests of their countries. And these historical antecedents also present huge opportunity for learning. And again, I believe through such workshops, the necessary platforms can be created 
for best practices to be shared among participating countries. So, honorable members, when Ghana became a republic in 1960, Nkuma, our first president of the land, attempted to create a set of unique value propositions that would characterize the conduct of business in the first parliament of the first republic, and in fact set it apart from the colonial legacies of the British system. And a major focus, a major focus of that endeavor was the institution of measures to trigger a paradigm shift from adversarial politics to consensus-based parliamentary system. And the idea was to reduce the impact of such confrontations that pitched the government against the opposition on matters of national interest. Certainly, we should learn from Kwame Nkrumah. But 64 years down the line, in the aftermath of the collapse of three republics, Ghana appears to be at the very spot of adversarial politics, which Nkrumah sought to avoid. Only time would tell as to whether the complexities of the current parliament will lead to the collapse of the Fourth Republic or herald the full maturity of our uh, democracy. Having spent 16 years myself in the House, I have no doubt at all that we will be able to sail through uh, these difficult times, difficult because of the lack of clarity in a couple of areas. We have uh, every confidence in the right honorable speaker to be able to uh, steers to the right uh, place. And I just want you to uh, know how encouraged I am that I believe that Ghana democracy will emerge as one of the best in the region. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Honorable Albert Kandapa the Minister for Stability. Like he said, he's been friends with the Right Honourable Speaker of our Eighth Parliament because they've been colleagues. Our Speaker has seen all the parliaments of the Fourth Republican Parliament, having been part of the Pania MPs that joined Ghana's democratic journey in 1993. He has risen through the ranks, has acted as a Whip has acted as minority leader, majority leader at various times, has crossed over to the executive, and now, if I then acted as a second deputy speaker, and now is at the apex of our institution. I don't think there is a better person qualified to do the job that he's doing now than he himself. And we're very happy to see him this morning, and I'm very happy to welcome him to deliver the keynote and opening address for this workshop. Let's please welcome him with a round of applause. very happy good morning to you all. I be informed that we've been blessed with the presence a lot of important dignitaries from various Commonwealth countries and some renowned resource persons and technical directors this morning. I will, with your kind permission, try to acknowledge the presence of those that have been informed are here. I'm not going through the names because the list is quite long. By taking a particular note of the presence of a few who are here with us. I'm told we have in our midst the old chairman 
of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and the executive members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. And we have delegations from a number of Commonwealth countries, the first being the team from the UK, made up of four honorable members and directors of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. I actually love the composition. Well, that team is really gender balanced. Two gentlemen, two ladies. I think this is the way to go. And I hope that the other parliaments have come the same way constituted. We also have a delegation from the National Assembly of Nigeria, Seychelles, Cameroon, definitely a large number from Ghana, the Republic of Mozambique, as, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Gambia, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and definitely not only the team that I refer to, some more members from the House of Commons of the UK. We have with us also the leadership of the Parliament of Ghana. You've already been given an idea of the kind of parliament I preside over by the Minister for National Security. In fact, he says he's now Minister for National Stability. Uh, I have not, as speaker, been officially informed. <laughs> and the House is not aware of that change. But in his usual manner, he decided to add that stability. He's actually the Minister for National Security. We also have the Minister for Defense, Minister for Interior, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Trade and Industry, and some lead members of the leadership of the various committees in Parliament, and a few members of Parliament are present here. We have also the Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps. We have the Presidential Advisor on Health. We have Chief Directors, Chief Executive Officers, and Directors of Ministries and Government Agencies here. And a number of distinguished resource persons who are going to definitely assist and facilitate this three-day workshop. We are blessed with the large presence of the Parliamentary Press Corps, and some invited guests are here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to warmly welcome you all on behalf of the Parliament and the 275 members of the Parliament of Ghana to our lovely and beautiful country. Ghanaians are known to be very warm, friendly, and hospitable. And we show this particularly in welcoming visitors to our homes. And we do this in various local languages. One is what my very good friend, the Minister for National Security, has just said. Aquaba, and it looks more common. But we also have Wezo, which is from another very large ethnic group in Ghana. 
and we have marhaba. We also have yewayane, and we also have nyejikuhu. And I'm sure I got that right. <laughs> that is the welcome that we hear from the indigenous of the land in which we are, the Gans of Ghana. Joining you today to deliver the keynote address at the official opening of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association workshop on the team trade and security effective parliaments in times of complexities here in Accra is an exciting opportunity for me and the pleasure is of government and guardians as a whole. Selecting Ghana as a host for this workshop represents for us a reassurance that our parliament and by extension democracy in Ghana must be on the right track towards success and impact. The recognition and encouragement that your presence here represents is most appreciated. Undoubtedly, it manifests the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's belief in Ghana as a democracy with much potential and prospects. We gladly accept the honor and are grateful to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Executive Committee for the opportunity to host this workshop. Mr. Chairman, distinguished participants, it is common knowledge that the Commonwealth is a voluntary association of 54 countries with the latest member, Rwanda, joining the association in 2009, and the readmission of Gambia and Maldives in 2018 and 2020, respectively. Member nations have a combined population of 2.4 billion people, almost a third of the world's population, and a gross domestic product estimated to have reached 13 trillion US dollars in 2020. An ambitious intra-commonwealth trade target was set by the Commonwealth heads of government of two trillion dollars by the year 2030. Yes, today is a world that can be described as being complex, full of uncertainties, very fast moving, and insecure. The complexities may include the fourth industrial revolution, the superhighway, terms that many people use about digitalization or digitization. It may include entrenched global webs of security gangsters, vandals who are threats to the peace of the world, and also the inexplicable COVID-19 pandemic with its variants. And sometimes I, I, I marvel at how we are able to describe the variants. Whether it's Delta or uh, Omicron or Delta Omicron or I just pray that one day my name is no use. Then we have also the youth bulge. And you know, 
the problem with mass unemployment and we have the threat of depopulation in some parts of the world. Again, we have the resurgence of unilateralism and the backsliding of democratic governance in the world. The sequel of all these complexities are the upset of abject poverty, economic depression, conflicts, terrorism, and in fact, failed countries. We are not admitting it, but all of a sudden, a number of countries have collapsed. We are getting the, uh, a new crop of leadership being produced by undemocratic means. Some of these countries I mentioned, you know, are embroiled in these situations. Mr. Chairman, I consider the timing of this question most opportune. This is because whilst intra commonwealth trade and investment remain of great value to member countries of the commonwealth a closer look ought to be taken at risks associated with health security and safety which institution or group of people are better placed to take a deeper and wider look at this situation than parliaments or the associations of parliamentary groups like the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. The association cannot ignore the fact that with the steady increase in intra-trade activities among Commonwealth countries, at a time of such complex global environment, there is an urgent need to bond together, to take decisive collective action, to assuage, if not prevent, these economic, health, and security catastrophes. As the former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, said during the Ebola crisis. Ebola is not just a health crisis. Across West Africa, a generation of young people risk being lost to an economic catastrophe. These were her words. Described as an epidemic that ravaged the social fabric of affected countries, Ghana's firm and decisive approach to Ebola enabled us to be recognized as one of the countries that did not record even a single case of the virus. Despite opening our doors to the establishment of an Ebola response headquarters at the Kutuka International Airport in Accra. This was done in partnership with the United Nations Mission on Emergency Ebola Response. And I believe the information sharing that we did was central to our response strategy in mitigating the spread of Ebola in Ghana. A comprehensive national preparedness and response plan was also developed. And it supported the implementation of many preventive strategies. The other things about temperature checks at entry points, contact tracing, aggressive testing, were all part of the government's protective protocols. Ladies and gentlemen, I am looking forward to the discussions at this workshop bringing to the fore the complexities and challenges imposed on the economies of member states of the CPA by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
we may also refer to the opportunities and challenges created by Brexit. Then the issue of global insecurity, and as I stated earlier on, the sequel of backsliding democratic governance in the world. How has these matters affected trade among member states? And what has been done to ease up the effects of such calamities? What more needs to be done going forward? And honorable members, we need to do this together. No single nation can do it alone. What is important, I refer to some opportunities of this great association. And I know many of you who have been part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for some time, you know beyond health or the complexities of the COVID-19 pandemic. This workshop offers a platform to discuss other critical issues. Definitely, the focus is on trade and security as they affect members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. But at the core of the ideas of the association is the common welfare of member countries. The common welfare of member countries. And once the member countries feel that there's that common welfare, it's not difficult to bond together. I believe the progressive alliance of the Commonwealth holds significant benefits for citizens of these countries when it comes to areas like democracy, education, human rights, security, justice, and trade. Justice, as you know, the Commonwealth judicial system or jurisprudence, very, very different from our colleagues. not even that which is practiced in the United States of America. That is quite a different system. Ghana, because we like or love hybrids, we always box them together. And these are some of the things that result in what my good friend, the Minister for National Security, referred to. The gray areas the doubts in the laws that we try to craft. I believe the most important wealth or treasure of the Commonwealth is its human resource. The Commonwealth is a global center of quality education. And the association invested greatly in human resource development and each country of the association has unfettered access to reap this investment. With this, honorable members will be able to, in spite of the serious global challenges we are facing, forge ahead together to take advantage of the inter Commonwealth trade and investments to develop our nations. The Commonwealth offers diverse opportunities for sharing best practice and for preparing particularly members of parliament for the arduous tasks ahead of them as representatives of the people. The multiplicity of learning opportunities that the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association represents finds expression in one of Africa's proverbial sayings, 
which suggests that, and I quote, knowledge from experience is like a baobab tree. No one can encompass it with his hands. To it, no one is a repository of knowledge on how things are done. Hence, diverse experiences from others can be beneficial. That is what the Conway Parliamentary Association represents to us. A platform to deepen one's understanding of the work of Parliament, relying on the knowledge and experience of others who have traversed this path before. And we all know when it started. Officially, around 1215. Additionally, the association offers a, an opportunity to engage in important conversations and through that, use the tool of experiential learning to not just as a knowledge base, but to sharpen the skills skills and tools of parliamentary practice and policy. I take very great pride in having been an active member of the Conway Parliamentary Association, rising up to become an executive member of the International Council and the current vice president on this reputable association. And I want to assure all of you that we are once again honored and happy to be hosting you next year to the International Conference here in Ghana. I consider my continuing service to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association as a duty, but it also gives me a sense of pride and it exposes me to such unimaginable insights into the works of various parliaments. And happily, I've almost visited, I think almost all the Commonwealth parliaments, some three times, four times, and I've learned a lot from them. None is the same as the other. I can boldly state that the knowledge and experiences acquired from the various platforms of the association have immensely impacted my appreciation of parliamentary practice and procedures throughout my 28 years as a member of parliament. This has served me extremely well in my current role as Speaker of Ghana's parliament. And I am indeed grateful to the association for this rare mentorship, grooming, experiential learning, and training. And I say I equal to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. I refer to my 28 years in the House, was I recall when I was the minority leader, 2001, I, together with the delegation of Ghana's Parliament led by the uh, right Honorable uh, uh, Peter Lajete went to the IPU and uh, I had a very good opportunity to be elected there as a, a vice chair of one of the committees and there was a contest for the executive position of the Interparliamentary Union and uh, some of us ventured. When the other competitors introduced themselves, the youngest was 26 years in parliament. And I was just 11 years. Uh, not even 11. 93 to 201. Just nine years. I mean, do I need any advice to drop out from the contest? 
In this game, monkey play by sizes. And so it is good and proper to allow elected members of parliament to mature in parliament. You can't keep on changing your members of parliament like sheds and expect to reap good dividends. You must give them the time to grow, to be able to produce the dividends that you want. Mr. Chairman, yes, a bit of the complexity of COVID-19 pandemic began a story. Because I know we have very important, very respected resource persons, technical directors to give you more information. But I believe that it could be a best case study in looking at how to combat this global threat. Those of you who have read much will recall the global pandemic of 1435, which used to be called the Black Death. It was also alleged to have started in China. And wherever it got to, it wiped up no less than half of the population of the time. And when the British got the information that it was coming closer to them, they had to summon all the religious to pray for God himself to intervene to prevent them from being inflicted by this global pandemic. It did not save the situation. It attacked with disastrous consequences. Changed Britain completely. But the generation at that time took advantage of the opportunities it created. And this is even the beginning where we started having the commons, the laborers being given the opportunity to negotiate for remuneration. And that is where this concept of wages and salaries started. So the COVID is not all bad, not just a crisis alone, but there are great opportunities. And the experiences of countries will assist us to get some of these opportunities and rather focus and invest in the opportunities to get life better for our people. And that is why I refer to the Ghana case. And I won't give the details, but it's clear that Ghana is usually cited as one of the best examples. And I want to take this opportunity to thank His Excellency the President Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, because it was through his leadership, with the support of the former president, I should say, collaboration of the former president, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, and the use of an effective parliament in Ghana supported by our technical and resource persons to see as true. Ghana's parliament was called upon to pass emergency bills, one of which had very serious 
challenges was the imposition of restrictions bill. And definitely you have various schools of thought. And there were intense debates. But what I say is that these schools of thought had their say. By the end of the day, the decision I was taking served the country well. Ghana and Ghanaians are better off than most developed countries. And that is where I would want to refer you to an article in the Washington Post who stated as follows that when it comes to coronavirus response, superpowers may need to study smaller nations. And I think this is a good platform for the delegates from the superpowers that we have here to study the experiences of the small nations in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot conclude without also referring or drawing your attention to this current political development in Ghana. For us in Ghana, our complexities in the past year transcend the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was based on the decision of the electorate to opt for a hung parliament. My friend, the Minister for National Security has given you a very good perspective. And I agree with him in many areas that he has touched on. Except to say that it's not near hung parliament. It's a hung parliament. The two major parties in parliament have 137 members apiece. Each party has 137 members. And what is interesting about this 137 is that the males are 117 each. And the females are 20 each. So, this claim of an independent member being a member of the party in government is erroneous and unconstitutional. Well, he knows very well that if they both belong to the same party, they cannot both hold the positions of deputy speakers of parliament. It's not me saying it. It's a 1992 constitution. It is the standing orders of parliament. And so it is this independent member who was a former member of the party in power that they want to draw their strength from. I am the speaker. I don't take part in decisions. But it is my duty to enforce the rules and the law. And in trying to do this definitely, a country that is used to tumultuous majoritarian governments will definitely meet resistance and there will be friction. But these are the feeding problems of change, of transformation. And I think that the only way, as he himself said, was to get the two sides to consult more, to dialogue, to cooperate with each other, to compromise, to collaborate, and to achieve consensus. This is an imperative imposed on us political leaders by the people of Ghana. 
We have no choice. And so, when the other side fails to gather their numbers, and a decision doesn't favor them, the speaker cannot be the cause. Because the speaker is not counted among members of parliament. I am not a member of parliament. In Ghana, the speaker is not. And that is what we opted for. And as I said earlier on, it's because of our penchant of trying to taking our historical background, merging and bringing things together, which we sometimes call hybrids. I, I, I don't know whether that term really properly describes those products. But that notwithstanding, I still maintain that the composition of Ghana's current parliament as a hung one presents the legislature with the unique opportunity to right some errors in the past. As a speaker of Ghana's parliament, one such opportunity I'm pursuing is leading a process that will ensure that the legislature is strengthened to play its role of an equal partner in the deliverance of an open, transparent, and accountable government. As part of the strategic objective of Gardas Parliament, and this document was produced by the seventh parliament, not the eighth. And so I came and met them, inherited them, we went through them, and they are good documents, and we are implementing those strategic objectives. And one of them is how we could enhance accountability to assist in sustaining Ghana's democracy. And I believe, and I'm a really a firm believer, of what Lifpat describes as consociational democracy. I believe in it. And I wish we could try to learn that as Switzerland is doing and as Netherlands is doing consociational democracy. It's a process of arriving at decisions through the most representative parliamentary coalition possible. You just don't come in and say, because I'm the party in power, or I'm the individual who is the executive president. This is what I want. No more, no less. I say this clearly, not just from my experience, but from the knowledge of the option we took as a country. It is possible in Ghana to have a government with minority members of parliament. And it is possible in Ghana to have an independent person being a president of Ghana. That is a legal framework we crafted for ourselves. And so if we don't learn this and imbibe this culture of give and take, of Jojo, of trying to look at the national interest by looking at parochial party interests, then our democracy will definitely not succeed. And it's not the prayer of anybody, at least with those who have experienced other systems of governance, that there should be some backsliding of our system. So please, it's a serious plea that I'm making. That if the context is that because during the elections, a person was elected to lead the country, that means that at all times, the person could opt to do what 
he or she wants. Or the few members of parliament in minority supporting that person will do whatever they want. It meant that in future we have a minority president, they will never get anything approved in parliament. And that's why we must build that culture now. And I'm extremely, extremely grateful to the unseen hand. And I believe it's the hand of God, the divine intervention to prepare guardians towards moving in that direction. And this calls for a rethink, a national conversation to decide the way forward. It's with this, distinguished honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to an edifying session full of great learning and insights that will place participants on the right path to understanding how to handle the theme of today's workshop, trade and security, effective parliaments in times of complexities. As individual parliaments, the sharing of experience and best practices that this forum offers should provide some guidance as to how we deal with our own in-country complexities. I am very optimistic that we will all come out of this workshop stronger in the face of the many challenges that confront us and primed in ways that feed into the aspirations of our people. I believe this will be a very packed workshop given the times in which we are and particularly the focus of the workshop. I am, however, encouraged and we want to encourage you to, to find some time to visit other places of interest in this beautiful country called Ghana. I believe you will enjoy it. Let me thank all of you for accepting to participate in this workshop. And I wish you a lively and fruitful session. God bless Ghana. God bless the Conway Parliamentary Association. God bless our mother, Commonwealth of Nations. I thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker of the 8th Parliament of the 4th Republic of Ghana. A couple of announcements. This program was streamed live on our Facebook um, channel, so anybody wanting um, a recording of it can visit Parliament of Ghana on our Facebook and our YouTube channel, Parliament of Ghana, and download them. The pictures, the still pictures, will also be uploaded within the hour, so you can go to our page and then have access to those. We'll take a group photograph in front of this building. The team lead for media relations of the Public Affairs Department, Mr. Obedapia, is coordinating that. After that, we'll have a quick snack, and then our first presenter, Israel Laie, is here. And so we'll go into the sixth, uh, sixth floor of the Job 600, and next day are ushers to take us around. We'll take us to the sixth floor on my left sixth floor of the job 600 and next and the multi-purpose hall is where we'll have our plenary and so for now we'll head down to the photograph and then a quick snack and then to plenary thank you very much and we wish you god's blessings and enjoy accra and ghana the speaker will leave first and then the rest of us will follow so may we please rise as he leaves
Honourable Members, because Mr. Speaker is going to um, be part of the photograph, may we follow immediately so that he does not have to wait for us while we get ready. So we are heading down for the photograph and then a quick bite and then to plenary.